ends today. And <clears throat> we look forward to this study as well. Uh, make sure you do get a pew bulletin. Do as I say, not as I do. I've forgotten the last two weeks, and if it hadn't been for Miss June, uh, I wouldn't see some of the important things that we have coming up. But it is important, especially this week. We have a lot of things coming up, and uh, it will do you good to make sure that you get one so it will help you keep track of some of these things. Remember, as we were talking in 1 Thessalonians last week, we saw that 1 Thessalonians was written shortly after the establishment of the church in Thessalonica. Uh, it provided spiritual reflections in chapters 1 through 3 and apostolic instructions in chapters 4 and 5. And the theme for 1 Thessalonians is holiness in view of the coming of Christ. And if you remember last week, we noticed that it was mentioned in each chapter. And we actually read uh, each of those mentions last Sunday, that they were mentioned in each of the five chapters. And not long after this, Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians. This is three short chapters, and the coming of Christ is an important theme again. This, this is a question that the church in Thessalonica was troubled with, um, that they had a lot of questions about, and evidently there were some false teachers in that area that were teaching things that, was, that were confusing them And so they had a lot of questions about this, and so Paul uh, mentions it again. And not only that, uh, he encourages the Christians in time of persecution, and then also cautions them against false conceptions about the return of the Lord. And this is an interesting one to me. You know, so many times we as, as Bible students, preachers, whatever you want to say, um, we'll take a verse out of a chapter. And there's nothing wrong in doing this, by the way. Um, like we might say, Luke 13, 3 tells us to repent. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And that's true, and that teaches, yes, we do need to repent. But then when you study it in its context, it's, it's, it's even more powerful. And that's the same in 2 Thessalonians. And hopefully, you know, we've got, by the way, today and Wednesday to cover 2 Thessalonians because we don't have the summer series right now, and so... I'll be able to teach on Sunday and Wednesday, so hopefully we'll be able to, to complete a lot more in depth of this book than, than we have been most books. But um, there was a caution against false conception of the Lord's return, and, and you'll see what I mean by that uh, coming up. Here's the purpose. <clears throat> to commend the church for remaining strong despite persecution, verses 3 and 4. Uh, even though these persecutions were coming, uh, they were remaining strong. And here's something I think we need to mention from time to time. You know, they had a lot of confusion. They had a lot of misconceptions. They had a lot of things that they needed to be straightened out about. But what does Paul start with? You guys are being faithful. You guys are being strong. Keep up your good work. As a Christian, sometimes we feel like, okay, I've got to have everything figured out. I can never... Uh, question things, I can never struggle, because if I do, then that means that I'm weak in some way. Well, not necessarily. These brethren had questions, and they had a lot of misconceptions, but Paul still calls them faithful and commends them for being faithful. Now, there is a time and sense that you can do that cause you to be unfaithful, but they're answering, uh, trying to get some answers to questions that they have. Still, as we've said, remains a misunderstanding about the Lord's return. And this is what I was talking about. Some were being troubled by false reports in chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And then this other one, others had stopped working, perhaps because they believed, well, the Lord's going to come uh, any day. And so here's your question to you. And, and we look at this and we laugh and say, you know, if the guys aren't working, well, they shouldn't be eating. And we use that as a, as a blanket statement. But look at the context here. If you knew in your mind, if you thought the Lord was coming on Friday, would you think you'd go to work on Monday? <laughs> what do you think? Or would you say, well, you know what? If I've only got five more days on this earth, I'm going to stay home and be with my family. I've got enough in my bank account to last me till Friday. Whatever was, was going on, would you be concerned with your job? Now, I'd like to say I would. <laughs> 
But I don't know that I would keep regular office hours uh, on, on Monday if I thought the Lord was coming on Friday. Now, I'm getting specific, and there's, there's not that specifics in here, but it seems like that's what some of the people were doing. Well, if He's coming any time, then what's the purpose of going and digging a ditch today? <laughs> you know, we don't, we're not going to need that ditch. Uh, this whole world's going to be burned up. We're not going to, I'm not going to go dig a ditch today. And uh, so, there were some problems uh, coming up because of that. Then we have a threefold purpose in the book of 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Remember, you know, I like to put typos in there just to keep you awake and honest. And if you find them, that means uh, you're, you're doing a good job. Actually, I just did this PowerPoint this morning. And so, there's probably quite a few in there. But if you find them, you get a penny. Threefold purpose, to encourage them in the midst of persecution. Uh, that was a big thing. To correct their misunderstanding about the Lord's return and then how to deal with those who refuse to work. So think about this. If half of Forest Hill said, well, you know what? He's coming any day, so I'm not going to go to work. And the other half was saying, well, you know, we don't know when he's going to come specifically. You need to make a living in, in the meantime and we're going to work. You think there might be some friction here? Especially if he didn't come Friday. It's, oh, you know, now I'm without a payment. Hey, Tom, can you float me alone until next Friday when I think he might be coming? And he doesn't come next Friday. How long do you think it would take for Tom to get tired of me saying, hey, Mark, you need to go back to work? So, how do we deal with those people who weren't going back to work? And so we look at this. And we think these were real problems. You know, I'm chuckling about it, but these were real problems that this church was facing. And it makes sense, doesn't it? There's a simple outline, and it is very simple. We're going to break it down more than this. But encouragement and persecution, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Enlightenment about the Lord's coming, chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And then exhortation to Christian living, chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. And so there it is. Uh, this first one, and I have it broken down more in my notes, and we'll see that. But let's look at this, this outline here, Encouragement in Persecutions, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Verses 1 through 4, you have a, a salutation and thanksgiving for their spiritual growth. Verses 5 through 10, encouragement and trials in view of the coming of Christ. And then verses 11 and 12, his prayer for them. Let's go ahead and start in chapter 1. I know that you've been reading this a few times already this week. So chapter 1, and uh, we'll start reading verses 1 through 4 to begin. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Let's go ahead and read verse 5 as well. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. And then we'll stop right there. <clears throat> you notice, first of all, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we are bound, verse 3, to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. And then, verse 4, in the midst of persecutions and tribulations, their faith is still growing. First of all, we can see this point that hard times happen, even to Christians, which might be a surprise for some people. Might be a surprise for some people. Hard times happen, even to Christians. And if you are expecting that, okay, once I become a Christian, all my troubles are over. It's, that's right, it'll be the Garden of Eden again. It's going to be disappointing, isn't it, for you? When you realize, wait a second, I've got some problems now that I didn't have then. And I've got some problems now that I still had back then. And if you were expecting everything to be, you know, rosy after you obey the gospel, it could be, it could be difficult, couldn't it? Uh, what, was a, what is a problem you have as a Christian that you didn't have as a non-Christian? I'm not looking for something specific, but in general, now I've got 
just try to stay faithful, don't I? I didn't have to do that before I was a Christian. I wasn't trying to be faithful, but now that I am, I've got the struggle of trying to remain faithful to this. Let's look at the Bible and see that there were warnings given. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. The Bible warns us about this, and Jesus <clears throat> warned his apostles about this. John chapter 15, look at verses 19 and 20. John 15, 19 and 20. Well, start at verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Why does the world hate Christians? Have you ever thought about that? When I say the world, understand what I mean, non-Christians. Why, why do they hate Christians? <clears throat> what do you think? Right, they feel like we're judging them. What were you going to say? Same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, <laughs> John says, what would you say? It goes with the media? <laughs> They're definitely a part of it, aren't they? Definitely a part of it. Here's the thing. Um, and I think this is an interesting point. <clears throat> when I'm not living like I should... Uh, whether I'm a Christian or not, if I know there's something out there that I should be attaining to, that either I'm trying to attain to and failing, or not even trying to attain to, but if I know there's something out there, you know, I know I should be a better person than I am. There's two ways I can go with that. I can either find out what it is I need to do and attempt to do it, or try to justify myself where I am. And Christians who are trying to attain to something greater, you know, if I'm out here and I've decided I'm going to try to justify myself where I am, but I see these Christians trying to become better than they are, what do I have to do? If I'm not going to try to attain myself, what do I have to do? I have to try to drag them down with me, don't I? So if I can look at them and find flaws, find things, you know, and, and try to bring them down to where, well, that makes me feel better about myself. That's, that's one thing. And so there is a sense in which just trying to be what Christ would have us to be, there is a sense of judgment in that. Because I have to judge where I am in the world is not where I need to be. And I need to be better. I need to be more Christ-like. And so how they would read that is, you're looking down on the rest of us. What should our attitude be? No. <laughs> I was there. I know what it is to be where you are. Um, I want to bring you up where Christ is. But you're right. They look at that as, well, you know, you think you're better than everybody else. No. We were just as lost. And we'll be again if we don't continue to be faithful. Uh, so the Bible warns us, look at chapter 16, verse 33 as well, of John. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. How about that? Hey, you're going to have a lot of problems, but be happy. <laughs> be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. Then the apostles, go with me to Acts now, chapter 14. <clears throat> Acts chapter 14, look at verse 22. Acts 14, 22. The apostles warned the disciples, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. The point we're trying to make is 
If we're surprised we still have problems or tribulations after becoming a Christian, a Christian, um, it's because we haven't read the warnings or maybe have forgotten. First Thessalonians chapter three verse four. For in fact we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith. Uh, and then 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Should we be surprised? Should we be surprised that the world hates Christians so much? Should we, should we be surprised that even in our country it seems like... Um, there seems to be a growing number of people who will attack those who are trying to live a righteous life. Should we be surprised by this? Should we be surprised that Hollywood keeps on putting out movies that will corrupt every good and pure thing that the Bible would try to show will make one happier in life? Should we be surprised by that? We've been told, we've been warned, and this warning goes on to over 2,000 years ago. And so hard things may happen, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Number two, I want you to notice the three things that got them through the difficult times. And I was thinking about this as I was studying it this past week, and, and, um, and I know <laughs> this, this is the wonder and amazement and the power of the Word of God. Whatever we're going through, in your mind, in your life, as a society, whatever it is, when you study the Bible, you know, no matter what it is, you think, man, this applies exactly to what I'm going through. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It could be a happy time. It could be a sad time. It could just be a grieving time. It could, uh, it, it could, it could be just about any time you're going through as you read it, even though you've read it before. And that's what I love about this reading that we're doing this year. It says, man, this applies perfectly to me. How do you get through difficult times? Does this apply to us? Remember back in March when they said, all right, we just need two weeks. We'll flatten the curve, and then you can go on. Everything will be normal after that. Remember that? And then it was two more weeks, and then two more weeks. And listen, I'm not, I'm not complaining, and I'm not saying that. Don't, don't read in too much to what I'm saying except this. There's been some difficult times the last few months, haven't there? There's been some very difficult times. Even though some have not gotten sick, most have not gotten sick, there's been some difficult times. What will get us through difficult times? Yeah, it's not exactly like what they were going through in Thessalonica. But three things. Number one, he mentions faith. Look at verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You know this passage. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Their faith was growing. Their foundation was growing. Uh, their evidence of things not seen was growing even in times of persecution. As you think about uh, the ramifications of what the church has been going through lately, the last few months, and it's been interesting in, in different parts of the country, different preachers you know, that I've talked to, different elders that I've talked to, there's a concern, and it's already manifested itself in some ways, that, you know, once we open back up the doors, how many people aren't going to come back? That's, and that's been a struggle, no doubt, for leaderships and congregations, and not just leadership, but each, each of us. How, how many aren't going to come back? How many are going to get so used to worshiping online that, you know, that's what they plan to do for the rest of their lives? And these are the discussions that have been going on. And, and again, 
you know, don't read too much into this. I think those personally who are, uh, who's, who are compromised health-wise, you know, I think they're doing the right thing. So if you're watching, <laughs> I'm not talking about you. <laughs> if you really want to be here and, and you feel like you can't, um, I'm not talking about you. But what I'm saying is, during this, and, and it might be that each of us have felt it at different times, but in times of persecution, in times of difficulties, our faith can go one of two ways. It can grow stronger, or it can get weaker. It's not going to stay the same. It's going to get stronger, or it's going to get weaker. And a good question to ask myself right here is, what has this present distress done to my faith? Number two, love. Look at verse three again. And the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. That abounds toward one another. What was their love doing toward one another? Look at 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> or if you don't, I can just read it to you. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. In this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be, be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. What was the church in Thessalonians during these difficult times? What was their love for one another doing? was growing wasn't it it was growing stronger and that's a beautiful thing to see it was growing stronger and then number three patience a patience that holds up in difficulty verse four so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience or endurance and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure look at Romans chapter 8 verse 25 Romans 8, verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Chapter 15, Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And then look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your own souls. Is the Christian race a sprint or a marathon? It's a marathon. How many have you seen obey the Gospels and start out on a sprint, but before long they get tired, they wilt away, and then you don't see them any longer? It happens, doesn't it? It is a marathon. It is something that we, that race that is set before us, we continue. So he starts with this great encouragement to them. But look at something else that he does for them. He tells them about a recompense is coming. And it's a righteous repaying. So go back to 2 Thessalonians. He encourages them. But then watch how else he encourages them. Since it is a righteous thing, let's go ahead and start with verse 5, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Stop right there. Recompense is coming and it's a righteous repaying. It's a righteous repaying. Rest is granted to the faithful who suffered persecution, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All of these people, he's telling these Thessalonians, who are troubling you, their day is coming. 
And it's not a something, well, you know, have you ever heard, um, well, I'm sure if you've had children, you've either felt this or said this, uh, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. Uh, and most of the times that's true, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> but have you ever wanted to whip one of your children just to make yourself feel better? <laughs> uh, sometimes, and it's at that point where you need not to whip your child. You need to wait a little while. <laughs> you know, if I'm doing this, not to teach them a lesson, but just to make myself feel better, it's probably time to stop. Count to 10 or 20 or 3 days or whatever it takes for you to calm down and then discipline your child. But with God, it's not just I'm getting you back and I can't wait to get you. It's, it's a righteous repaying. That's exactly right. When will the rest come? Well, when the Lord comes. When will the trouble receive recompense? When Christ comes. Um, and as we've said, it's going to be a righteous Vengeance. Uh, why is it righteous? How is it righteous? It's a righteous repaying. Based on God's word. It's the right. He's, he's given the standard. And if you could get the same reward that all faithful Christians get. By making no changes. Enjoying the things of the world. Is that a righteous thing? No. Right. If I am a loan officer, and I used to be this, you may not have known this about me, um, but I was for a couple of years, and I hated it. <laughs> I was in the financial business. I loved lending money. Man, you're everybody's favorite person at that time. But the hard part is was when you asked them for, them, for it back. <laughs> you remember that money you borrowed? We're going to need that back. <laughs> and you promised on the 30th of every month that you would make this payment. And if you didn't, that car that you bought, you, you knew, it says right here in the contract, we're going to have to pick up that car. Now, would it be a fair thing for me when I was in that business? Well, you know what? You haven't made a payment in a year. You're still driving that brand new Mercedes. But, um, you know, I'm just going to let you keep it. And all these other customers who are paying uh, on time, I'm going to ask all of them to pay a little bit more to make up for what you've lost. Is that fair to everybody else? Well, no, it's not fair. That wouldn't be a righteous thing. Notice something else in this. Um, I think it's an important lesson that we're going to be seeing uh, this afternoon. We're going to be talking about the Antichrist. And I texted Jeremy yesterday and said, here's my morning sermon. And it'll be easy to pick out songs for that. And in the afternoon, I'm going to be talking about the Antichrist. And then I just said, good luck with that. <laughs> so we'll see what he comes up with this afternoon. But, but here's some things in preparation and thinking for that lesson. I want us to notice some things about the coming of Christ uh, when he is revealed. That word revealed, um, look at verse 7 again. To give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That word revealed means to unveil, to take the cover off, a visual manifestation. When Jesus comes, and you know, I'll butcher this, but I think it's apocalypto, maybe in the Greek, um, to unveil, to take the cover off, a visual manifestation. So when the Lord Jesus comes, when he's revealed, when the cover is taken off, when there's that unveiling, there's that visual manifestation when he comes, you can take rest, but we're going to have recompense on those who have been troubling you. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Then we'll make a point. Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. When Jesus comes, when he is revealed, is it going to be a secret coming? What's it going to be? Every eye will see him. There will be a visual manifestation. When Jesus comes, there will be no doubt that he's coming. There'll be no doubt. 
And the reason we bring that up is because there are those who teach that when he comes, it's going to be a secret. It's going to be a secret coming. And those who are faithful will be raptured up, taken away. And nobody will know what happened to them. For instance, if some here are faithful and some are not, then some will disappear and the rest of us will be thinking, well, where'd they go? Where did they go? And what they'll say is, well, Jesus came. Does this sound like this? No. Yes, sir. Oh, Brother Ted. And for those listening online, Brother Clark was saying that, you know, it looks like at times where people who are living worldly lives, and I'm paraphrasing, looks like they're getting away with it, and they may be. They may be resting now while we might be suffering tribulation, and we might be tempted to take that persecution of them into our own hands and give them what they deserve. Uh, the Lord's going to take care of that. And... That, it is restful. I was thinking about Asaph's psalm when he, you know, that was his whole promise. That's Psalm 73, 73, where, you know, he's looking at the world and it gets him down as he's looking at the world. You know, why are the heathens getting richer and richer and richer? And I'm struggling. And he goes to the house of the Lord and things start to make sense. And, and, and there it is. There it is. Um, and, you know, in all seriousness, you, you look at, and if you you don't have to admit it, I will. You look at people, you think, man, how can somebody so evil just be loved by so many, followed by so many, and, and why can't people see through what's you know going on? And, and, and that can make you bitter, and that can ruin your life as a Christian. It can steal your joy, isn't it? Can it? Uh, this, is, this is needed. <laughs> For our political climate today, you think this is needed? Yeah, it is. It, it, it's needed. We, the Lord's going to take care of it. Um, and it's not going to be a secret coming. Every eye will see Him. He's going to be revealed. And then, uh, this is the part I want to take. Look at Romans chapter 2. Now here I was thinking, well, you know, we've got three chapters. We've got two weeks to do this. This will be easy. But look at Romans chapter 2. And I think this is a powerful passage. It goes right along with what Brother Clark was saying. Romans chapter 2. Verses 4 through 11. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? <laughs> and that does, sometimes you do. Why is He being so patient with that person? Why doesn't He strike them dead like He deserves? But in accordance with your hardness of your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation at the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Why does he say things like that of the Jew first and also to the Greek? What's that mean? When you read that, what's that mean? Why well, talk about Jews and Greeks? That's everybody, isn't it? You're not a Jew, what are you? You're a Gentile. In other words, it's going to be for everybody all over this world. Um, it's going to be a righteous, 
recompense. Uh, Paul describes it more fully in the next few uh, verses, but notice just a few things. Number one, his revealing, going back to 2 Thessalonians now, <clears throat> and I think this is another important thing. Where will Jesus be revealed from? He's being revealed from heaven. Where is he now? He's from heaven, all right? So he's going to come from heaven. He's going to be revealed. And where did he promise the disciples, the apostles, that he would take them? He was, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where was he going? He was going to heaven. Where will he be revealed from? Heaven. So where will he be taking the faithful back to? Heaven. Is he going to say, I'm going to come and I'm going to stay here with you on earth and have this renovated earth? Or am I going to take you back to where I am? He's going to be back, going to be revealed from heaven. He's going to take us back with him to heaven. Uh, notice also, his mighty angels will accompany him. So it's not going to be just Jesus coming. His mighty angels. Does that sound like a secret thing to you? <laughs> and he'll come in flaming fire. <laughs> this, this is not just a, all right, let's all be really careful. Angels, get behind me. Let's all tiptoe back to earth. Get just a few. and We'll come back and nobody will ever know we've been there. No, it's going to be Jesus coming. His angels coming. Flaming fire coming. It's not going to be a secret coming, is it? Uh, but notice this as we have just the rest of this time to do this. This day is going to be a day of honor for Jesus. He's going to be revealed. Verses 10 through 12. Let's go ahead and read that. Well, let's just read the rest of it. Uh, verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ going to be a day of honor for Jesus. He'll be revealed. He'll be glorified. He'll be admired and marveled at. He'll be held in ad admiration. Verse 10. It's going to be a day of judgment by Jesus. Some will receive a rest. Chapter 1 verse 7. A time of glory. Verse 12. It's going to be a terrible day for others, isn't it? It'll be a time of vengeance. Verse 8. On those who persecuted Christians. And then others who did not know God, the most important thing to know in their lives, and they didn't know it. And those who did not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you've got a group of people who did not know God. How does Romans chapter 1 say that those who did not know God didn't have an excuse? What could they have looked at to cause them to question Creation. Somebody had to make this. They didn't know God. They didn't investigate that. What, what happened? How did this happen? And then number two, those who knew but didn't obey the gospel. How many people do you know that know? And you know they know. And yet, they're not doing what they need to do to obey the gospel or to remain faithful. Yeah. You know, I heard a preacher say before, the hardest part about being a preacher, I think this is when we were in school, we had a guest speaker come, said is not the sermon preparation, not people letting you down, not people having unreal expectations and all of those things, you know, that preachers, every job is going to have struggles. Preachers are no different. But he said the hardest thing about preaching is when there are people in your audience, in the audience rather, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, that you know 
know what they need to do. But you just sit there and watch them. And uh, that really struck with me, stuck with me, and struck a nerve because I think every preacher would be able to say, yep, that's it. <laughs> you know, once somebody else says, it, yep, that's, that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part. Um, two purposes. Why this is going to take place and then we're out of time. Two purposes. Number one, that the name of Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. And that you may be glorified in him. That the name of Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and that you may be glorified in him. Why should we let our light shine? What does that do? Glorifies God. Hey, look at me. Look how good I am. No, if you're doing it for that reason, there's a problem, isn't it? What's the purpose of, of letting our light shine? Let me glorify your Father, which is in heaven. We must be in Christ to glorify him. How do we get there? Galatians 3, 26 and 27 were baptized into him. If you think about this, and I'm going to use, you know, every time you bring up brand names, you're, you're going to make some people happy and make some people mad, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to use one, well, I'm not going to tell you where I stand on it because I don't want to get in a fight. The name Ford, what's that represent? <laughs> See, that's the one I knew I was going to have problems with. I want to say it's found on road dead, but <laughs> I didn't say that because I knew I would cause some people to stumble. No, first on race day, uh, what's that rep it represents everything the company stands for, doesn't it? When you, when you see the name Ford, you think of everything that the company stands for. When I am a Christian, What's that name mean? Everything that Christ stands for, it should be seen in my life. Shouldn't it? Christ was loving, what should I be? I should be loving. If Christ was patient, what should I be? If, if, if Christ is kind, what should I be? In all of these things... Um, we're out of time. We got done. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 on Wednesday. We'll talk about the man of sin. That ought to be an interesting study. Come back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Well, stay for worship too. <laughs> Let's get ready to worship.